Good evening and thank you for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Parikshit Lutra and here are the headlines we are tracking at this hour. After slowing for two months, inflation accelerates in January to 6.5%, well above street expectations. Food prices are the main culprit. Cereal prices have risen 16% compared to last year. All 10 Adani Group stocks end in the red as the sell-off continues. Adani Group pledges additional shares worth more than 1,000 crore rupees to SBI. The bank says this is a top-up for the Carmichael project in Australia as companies are required to maintain 140% collateral coverage. Supreme Court hears the Adani case, asks the government and SEBI if a proper framework is in place to protect retail investors and suggests setting up an expert panel. The government says it is open to an expert panel but wants suggestions to be tabled in a sealed envelope only for the eyes of judges. Global auto majors Renault and Nissan plan to invest 5,300 crores in India to develop electric vehicles and SUVs, promise to create 2,000 jobs and want to establish a full supply chain for EVs in India to gain a competitive cost advantage. Supreme Court directs SpiceJet to encash bank guarantee and pay 270 crore rupees to former promoter Kalaniti Maran within two weeks. SpiceJet's lawyer asks for the interest rate to be lowered and says Marans are free to reverse the transaction and take the airline back. Vistara CEO Vinod Kanan says merger with Air India on track for on-time completion adds Vistara will operate as an independent airline and will treat Air India's competition until the merger is complete. Prime Minister Modi inaugurates Aero India 2023, India's largest aviation show. Over 800 companies from 98 countries in attendance. More than 250 MOUs worth 75,000 crore rupees are expected to be inked at the five-day event. One week after a series of earthquakes, rescuers pull out a woman alive from the rubble of a collapsed building in Turkey. The death toll crosses 34,000. Vital aid to Syria is being held up due to disputes between government and rebel groups. More than 5 million people are estimated to be homeless in Syria. US military shoots down another unidentified object flying at uh, high altitudes. This is the fourth flying object shot down by the United States in a week. Officials are yet to reveal more information. With a 3.4 crore bid from RCB, Smriti Mandana gets top billing at the inaugural player auction of the Women's Premier League. Deepti Sharma, Jemima Rodrigues, Shifali Verma, Harbanpreet Kaur and several foreign players receive bids of more than 1 crore rupees. And time to take a look at the day's trading action, a rage-bound session. So the Lull Street end the day lower. Nifty and Sensex ended close to half a percent lower. IT and financials remained the biggest drag for the market. Midcaps underperformed the benchmarks. That uh, index fell 1.5% as weak earnings led to a steep fall in certain stocks. The rupee depreciated 17 paise to end at 82.7 against the US dollar. A strong American currency and muted trends in domestic equities weighed on the sentiment. Oil prices softening ahead of crucial inflation data from the U.S. Uh, tomorrow, which could force the Fed to pursue a more aggressive monetary tightening policy. This trader's field could impact demand for oil. Moreover, resumption of Azerbaijan oil exports from Turkey's Kehan terminal eased, eased some supply chain concerns. The big headline of the day, inflation has accelerated in January to 6.5% after cooling for two months. This is well above street expectations of 6.1%. Food and cereal inflation are the main culprits. Lata Venkatesh is here with more on the inflation fine print. Yes, that's right. This 6.52% is a complete shocker. Uh, even the widest range of our, uh, you know, poll responses came nowhere above 6.2%. So this is a complete shocker for us and for the guests whom we spoke with. Uh, what is even worse than the 6.52 headline number is the reason for that rise. The reason is food inflation. Food inflation, which came in at 4.19% last month, this month is up 5.92%. So the full one percentage point higher. The uh, Within food inflation, 
what is most ubiquitously consumed cereals is the biggest culprit cereals are up 2.6% month on month and 16.2% year on year that is perhaps what uh, both economists and the central bank were not prepared for other items uh, protein items like pulses and even more uh, meat and fish egg and milk are other products that are up uh, between 8 and uh, 9% leading to a very strong rise in food inflation core inflation which is largely services you know personal services transport services recreation services that lot is also up 6.1% like it was in december but that's largely on expected lines uh, what is unexpected is uh, that uh, the reserve bank will have to move now very strongly when the reserve bank hiked rates on feb 8th the expectation was that they did not guide whether they will rise or whether they will hike again or not hike because they just wanted to wait and see but now a large part of the market will expect that the reserve bank has to hike rates uh, when the when they announce the policy in april rbi must have uh, you know had some kind of a clue about today's data print and that's why uh, you see the undertone of the last policy review was very hawkish and uh, i personally feel they retained that flexibility because they must have sensed this we cannot be very optimistic about uh, uh, rbi's future uh, actions and that's why they have retained that flexibility and nobody can rule out that there could be another rate hike also clearly the negative shock has come entirely from food uh, the other items are by and large in line with what we were expecting mm -hmm. now uh, in terms of the average for the quarter we anyways expected q4 to be very flattish as compared to q3 so we were puzzled why uh, the rbi uh, the mtc had reduced their calculation for uh, the current quarter a lot of the seasonal factors that take uh, the food index down or the food inflation down um, would ease out from february onwards so we cannot expect there to be too much of a benefit from lower vegetable prices for example uh, going forward all right, the other big story we are tracking. All 10 Adani Group companies, including NDTV, ended in the red today as the route continues. Group stocks lost over 51,000 crore rupees in market cap just today, taking the total loss since the Hindenburg report to more than 10 lakh crore rupees. The group has lost 64% from their peak valuation and 53% since the Hindenburg report. The group has pledged additional shares worth more than 1,000 crore rupees to SBI for the Carmichael project in Australia. Shares that amount to 1% stake in Adani Ports, 0.5% stake in Adani Transmissions and 1% stake in Adani Green have been pledged additionally. SBI said Adani Group's pledge was used to only top up the collateral and no new loans will be sanctioned. Meanwhile, Congress leader Manish Tiwari asked the Finance Ministry about the exposure of public sector banks, insurance companies and other public sector institutions to the Adani Group. The Finance Ministry responded saying New India Insurance, United Insurance, National Insurance, Oriental Insurance and General Insurance have exposure to the Adani Group which amounts to 0.14% of their total assets under management. However, the government statement added that financial institutions like Exim Bank, SIDB, NHB and Nabad could not divulge information under their act. And Vivek here, Ayer is here with all the key developments and the movement in the Adani Group stocks. Uh, Vivek, over to you. Well, some important developments uh, that uh, took place and which impacted the stock prices of the Adani Group stocks are first on our list, you know, the ASM frameworks, the three of the Adani Group stocks were put into Adani uh, Ports, Ambuja Simmons, as well as Adani Enterprises. Two of the stocks uh, were removed out of the ASM framework, meaning that less margin upfront requirement would be required to go ahead and trade in these particular names. Uh, also, you know, some important action coming in as far as rating agency Moody's is concerned. While Moody's retained its rate across all of the Adani Group stocks. For four of the companies where they have rating, they cut the outlook from a stable to a slightly negative outlook. So Adani Green Energy, Adani Transmission, Adani Electricity were three of the names uh, where you actually saw the you know, uh, outlook being reduced by Moody's. Uh. Now also some important development in terms of pledging activity. What actually happened is that there were additional shares uh, that were pledged by the Adani Group and this was done in favor of the SPI cap trustee. Uh, so you know, Adani Ports, the pledge has now gone up from 0.65% to 1%. Uh, Adani Transmission as well as Adani Green too saw their pledges going higher. So we had, you know, uh, SBI management 
come on our channel where they actually said that there has been no new fresh loan being given rather this is a top up requirement for the carmichael project where uh, you know uh, sbi had actually given a loan as far as the adani group is concerned uh, and in fact when you're talking about the sbi chairman we have the management with us uh, where they've clearly uh, stated you know the amount of exposure as well as you know right now how is it that they're looking at this particular exposure that they have to the adani group we have an exposure of uh, us dollar 300 million facility that was granted for the adani groups uh, carmichael facility in australia uh, of which uh, they have drawn down uh, usd 180 million towards the railroad part of the project uh, while the mines uh, they have so far managed to complete with their own resources so there is a, one of the covenants for this facility is that uh, they should maintain uh, 140% collateral coverage in addition to the project assets they are required to maintain this collateral coverage by way of pledge of shares from the three companies belonging to the group this is not uh, any uh, loans that was granted against pledge of shares and uh, no additional finance was granted against this additional pledge these are essentially to maintain a covenant that is pre existing in terms of an earlier uh, facility uh, which is completely covered both by project assets as well as this collateral coverage and supreme court heard the adani case and asked the government and sebi if a proper framework is in place to protect retail investors and suggested setting up of an expert panel ashmit kumar joins us now with the details Well, just for the context to begin with, it's on Friday that there was the first hearing in this case, and that's when uh, the Supreme Court had served up three issues before the Solicitor General. The first was about the sufficiency and the competency of the current framework for investor protection. The Supreme Court had said that uh, middle class has massive exposure uh, to the stock markets, that uh, lacks of wealth has been eroded, and therefore had sought questions from uh, the Solicitor General on sufficiency of the current framework uh, for investor protection. The second was on whether or not additional legislative or regulatory tools can be used for strengthening this framework that was the second issue the third was uh, what about an expert panel this was a suggestion that fell from the apex court that perhaps an expert panel may be needed uh, to advise to recommend uh, any additions or changes uh, to the framework in place now these questions were answered in brief by the solicitor general today before the apex court first up uh, the solicitor general appearing on behalf of the government he said that the current framework is in fact competent to deal with such scenarios such shocks uh, that there are enough secure or safeguards in place that was first uh, the second solicitor general said that uh, at this point while this current system was sufficient it was uh, open to the idea that was suggested by the apex apex court for suggesting for having an expert panel that was the second key takeaway the third is that importantly solicitor general warned and perhaps expressed concern on behalf of the government that look uh, if an expert panel is deliberating on the issue it could send potentially adverse uh, situation signals to global investors and that may be a cause of concern and towards that end uh, what has fallen from the solicitor general is that the scope and the limit of this expert committee should be limited and that the government should be the one suggesting names of experts to this panel and towards that end has said that it will submit both of them in a sealed envelope only for the eyes of the judges so no call has been taken on that yet the matter will be taken up for further hearing on friday that's when uh, the supreme court will resume hearing Meanwhile, market regulator SEBI, in an affidavit to the Supreme Court, highlighted that the current framework in place for investor protection is robust, validated not just in recent weeks but also through pandemic. SEBI said that if that it would undertake detailed examination as per existing regulatory framework. Moving on, Renault and Nissan are set to invest 5,300 crore rupees to develop four special utility vehicles and uh, two electric vehicles for the India market. The alliance through fresh R&D investments aims to create 2000 new jobs. The company's global CEO Ashwini Gupta tells CNBC TV18 that Renault Nissan would like to establish a full supply chain for electric vehicles in India to gain a competitive cost advantage. This new chapter in India um, will be based on our last 15 years uh, of experience but also the growth potential of India becoming the third largest market. Hence Uh, we decided to invest 600 million dollars or 5300 crores of rupees in six brand new products out of which four uh, brand new products will be c segment suvs for renault and nissan and two a segment 
battery, uh, battery electric. In addition to that, we will create additional 2,000 employment, not only to do uh, the development in India for India, but also doing the software development and the digital uh, development out of India for mm -hmm. our whole uh, worldwide operations. And Vistara CEO Vinod Kanan has said that the merger with Air India is on track for on-time completion. Speaking to CNBC TV18, Kanan said that structure, organization, processes and knowledge sharing has already happened. But, till, but until the merger is complete, Vistara is treating Air India as competition. He also said that Vistara will have 70 planes in its fleet by end of 2024. The process has started. There are various uh, authorities to whom we have to apply. As you might know, there's competition, of course, Competition Commission of India. There are competition authorities around the world, which we are also looking at. Uh, there's also the uh, uh, NCLT, which is another, you know, industry, I mean, a body which we have to get approvals for. So all those uh, work streams have actually commenced, and they are in various stages. Uh, of course, uh, we can't talk about anything that is sensitive commercially because we don't have competition or antitrust approvals. Therefore, we can't talk to Air India on those bases. Uh, but in terms of structure, in terms of organization, in terms of processes uh, and, and some knowledge sharing, I think that has uh, already happened in terms of SOPs and, and best practices. Uh, as far as the timelines are concerned, I'm still hopeful that this will happen. In fact, we hope that it can be expedited uh, because it's always good to have closure to this as soon as we can. And we'll try to do that. And staying with the aviation sector, the Supreme Court has given SpiceJet two weeks to encash a bank guarantee and pay Kalaniti Maran 270 crore rupees, an interest worth 75 crores for an arbitral award. SpiceJet's lawyer asked for the interest rate to be lowered and said the Marans are free to reverse the transaction and take the airline back. India's defence uh, might was on full display on day one of the Aero India 2023, touted to be Asia's biggest aviation show. Prime Minister Modi inaugurated the five-day event in Bengaluru. More than 800 companies from 98 countries would be participating. MOUs worth 75,000 crore rupees are expected to be inked. Ritu Singh captures all the action from Aero India and the government's Make in India pitch. हमारा लक्ष्य है कि 2024-25 तक हम एक्सपोर्ट के इस आंकड़े को डेढ़ बिलियन से बढ़ाकर पांच बिलियन डॉलर तक ले जाएंगे। Well, Prime Minister Modi today inaugurated the 14th edition of the Aero India here in Bengaluru, hoping to garner investments of more than 75,000 crores. Several global players present here at the exhibition. We spoke to many of them. Boeing, for instance, said it will look to expand its presence in India and set up a logistics warehouse. Uh, it expects significant demand to come from in, in India and wants to garner a large chunk of that. Uh, Swedish major Saab also said uh, it is bullish on India's defense market and said while it had mutually called off the MOU with Adani Group, uh, it would not say no to a potential future partnership, although it did not comment further uh, on this matter. Uh, France based Thales also said it will expand its footprint here and double down on hiring as it completes 70 years in India. A billion dollars or 8,000 crores every year, that is the exports or the sourcing we do from India each year, yes. right? Yes. Of which two-thirds is manufacturing. Yes. Um, in terms of investments, there's an additional $200 million campus that we're doing right here in Bengaluru. Okay. And then... Um, this logistics center, you know, we don't have an exact number, but it'll be in the in the 200 crore realm uh, of investment. While you've said that you decided to part ways with the Adani Group mutually, uh, but in future, if an opportunity does arise, would you look at partnering with them again, or have you severed ties for good? I, we, we, I don't say no to anyone when it comes to that. It's depending on the situation. In certain cases, Company A is better than Company B, and Company C could be better than Company D, and so forth. So at this door, we are not closing any doors for future partnerships. We see a great potential uh, to develop our presence in India and to uh, not only address the Indian market, which is obviously very attractive, but also address the global market from India. So our engineering centers. Uh, in Noida and Bangalore currently represent uh, 1,400 uh, engineers. Uh, 
uh, and we plan to double this number by 2026. More than 800 companies are going to be participating in this five-day-long exhibition. About 100 of them are foreign companies and more than 700 are actually Indian companies, which includes some of the MSMEs and startups that will be showcasing their niche technology, the growth uh, in the aerospace and defense capability that they've achieved in the last few years. The theme this time around for the event is runway to a billion opportunities. And with the government's Make in India push, Indian companies also see huge potential for growth. Uh, we already have uh, uh, surprisingly very large export orders mm. uh, for our artillery guns. Mm. And five years ago, if anybody asked me would I ever be exporting artillery guns to mm. Europe, yeah. I, would, I would have said no. Okay, because I, I, I never thought that this could be possible. And time for a short break, but coming up with a 3.4 crore rupee bid from RCB, Smriti Mandana gets stopped billing at the inaugural player auction of the Women's Premier League. Details when we are back. Welcome back. You're watching India Business Hour. The first ever Women's Premier League auction witnessed an intense bidding war. Over 400 players went under the hammer, out of which 246 were Indians. Indian ace uh, batter Smriti Mandana received uh, the top bid of 3.4 crore from Royal Challengers Bangalore. Network 18's Srinivas Rao is here with the report. So what we saw today at 2.30 p.m., the start, it was the start of a new chapter in women's cricket. Uh, the auction was, uh, is rather being held in Mumbai uh, at the Geo World Centre. And uh, five franchises, five franchises that just walked into this like, ecosystem, sat down, wrote the checks for the big names uh, that have been picked up. Uh, Smriti Mandana, uh, the biggest name, has gone to Royal Challengers Bangalore. Harman Preet Kaur, another big India cricketer, has gone to Mumbai Indians. And... Uh, uh, you know, what happened in IPL 15 years ago when franchises first came in and invested in big players, Indians and overseas, is the same narrative that we are looking at 15 years later, where once again the start of women's cricket, women's Premier League has happened with big bets being taken on well-known cricketers from India and abroad. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Srinivas, for joining us. Moving on, diversity and inclusion has been a key priority area for ITC. Hand in hand with scaling up its various businesses, the FMCG to hotels conglomerate has also been scaling up women's participation to the extent that five of the company's 11 FMCG plants are either manned and operated 100% by women or have women in majority on the workforce. As part of our ongoing campaign, Future Female Forward, a women's collective, CNBC TV 18's Shilpa Rani Peter reports that while this transformation has not been without challenges, the company is not looking at slowing down on increasing women participation in its operations. From not being allowed to work in a factory to building a house for her handicapped father, 29-year-old Vanilla Periyasami has come a long way. An operator at one of ITC's largest FMCG plants in Tamil Nadu city of Trichy, Vanilla says being financially independent has helped her not only fulfill her dreams but those of her family as well. My father is handicapped. He used to sell snacks on a cart. My father wished to have a house for 30 years but no one granted us a loan because he's handicapped. After I became an operator, I got a loan of 12 lakh rupees basis my salary. We built a 2 BHK with that money. My younger sister could also finish her degree using this money. Vanilla is just one of the many stories at this ITC Foods plant, which employs 2,700 workers, 77% of them women. Their assignments are varied, from security to factory operators to HR. And it's not an accident. This greater participation of women across functions is a direct result of ITC's larger conglomerate-wide efforts to induct more women into its workforce. That's a very important focus area for the company. And we have taken a series of steps to improve uh, not just representation, but also engagement as well as involvement of women across the workforce. We have particularly focused on campus recruitment, where, for example, over 44% of our management recruits today are women employees. 
uh, in many of our businesses like hotels, uh, approximately 60% of new entrants at management are women employees. But this initiative has come with its own set of challenges. Take for instance this factory here in Trichy, which earlier faced challenges in hiring women because of resistance from families to allow them to work. And then women having to juggle both work and going back home and doing household chores and a reluctance for night shift also resulted in high attrition rates earlier. ITC says tackling such problems went beyond just putting women-friendly policies in place. We go out to hold road shows where we engage with parents, with family members. We invite them to come to the factories and spend some time, go through, see the infrastructure, allay their concerns, questions, queries. Uh, I think typically they range around what's it like to work, is it safe? Having seen the real picture, I think a lot of them then convert and agree. Women workers at the factory say working in an environment where women are numerically dominant gives them a sense of community and has helped bring more and more women into the workforce. We can speak to the HR about our problems and so I really like working here. Safety is also important here. We don't have any fear of returning to work after delivery and maternity leave. If other companies also ensure this like ITC, women can return to work without worrying about their career getting affected. The company also runs a women's economic empowerment program that extends beyond offering microcredit, skilling and promoting cooperatives and self-help groups. Its special focus is on uplifting and enriching ultra-poor women. The goal? Make women financially independent and strengthen their position as decision makers in their families. In Trichy with camera person Milan Bagmare, Shilpa Rani Peta. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business Hour. Thank you for watching. News continues right here on CNBC TV 18.